Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, on behalf of this church, we would like to thank you for choosing us as your venue. And tonight, having been given this wonderful privilege of sharing a few thoughts from the Word of God tonight, I realized that I would like to speak something that's based on my own experience with missionaries, missiologists, pastors, and professors in seminary, just like most of you are. And that's about something that we call discouragement. Discouragement. You see, before such a distinguished group, where some of you have two or three PhDs, uh, I have only a uh, doctorate. It's not even a, a spiritual doctorate. It's a medical doctorate. I was thinking about something that's always been true in my own experience. You see, not so long ago, a few months ago, we had another big international forum here, the Global Diaspora Forum. And we talked about very similar things, but in a different context. In the Global Diaspora Forum, I had the chance of speaking with missionaries, missiologists from other countries. And one thing I always found out was, whether you are a practitioner on the mission field, you're in a seminary, you write books, there was always the element of discouragement. When you probe beneath the surface, when you begin to know people, you know, they could be smiling at you and talking to you about the latest book they just will publish, but deep in the heart they'll tell you, you know, it's not been easy. I was talking with a missionary uh, last year from the United States, and he, I asked him, well, wh what is God's plan for you, brother? He said, I don't know if I'm going back there or staying here in the Philippines or raising my own support here. I said, that's hard raising your own support here, brother. Uh, you know, we're a third world country. He said, do you know that support for Americans, for, mis uh, for missions from America is decreasing? I said, why is that? He said, it's just the attitude of the people. Even committed people, he said, are attending less. And when they're attending less, the support is going down. Uh, and he said, will you pray for me? I said, I'm going to pray for you. That's a serious situation. And he was obviously discouraged. Tonight, beloved, I'd like to share with you, just from my heart, in the time that I have, seeing God's mission from God's perspective. And actually, I subtitled this, Our World as God Sees It. I would like to share with you tonight the very basic idea that because God always wins, God's mission ultimately succeeds. No mission effort ultimately fails. It will always achieve the purpose for which God raised it. And I want to begin by asking you to imagine something. How differently would you live if you knew how your life would end? How differently would you live if you knew exactly how your life would end? For example, uh, an angel from heaven comes down. Uh, and then, of course, you're a very conscientious scholar. You say, I want to check your credentials. He presents all the IDs from heaven. Okay, you're a genuine angel. The angel says, God sent me to tell you this. What? Uh, God told you, God is telling you, you will die through an airplane. Really? Thank you for that information. And then before you get to ask him some more questions, he disappears. Poof. He's gone. Will you live differently from then on? Well, of course you will. You probably will be given a free round-trip ticket to uh, Disneyland and uh, uh, airplane tickets free, and you'll say, uh, no, I'd rather take the boat. <laughs> you know, you'll do everything to avoid airplanes because the angel didn't tell you when, right? He told you how. He didn't tell you when, and it doesn't help because you might avoid riding airplanes, but what if an airplane falls on your home? You're not safe either. But I know you will live differently. You know, that's what... Daniel 7 does for us. That's what the Bible does for us. It tells us how the world will end, but not when. And tonight, as we look at this uh, chapter, it actually reminds us that this is our world as God sees it. Uh, this is going to be about a dream. It's a summary of many prophecies in the rest of the Bible. That's why many Bible scholars consider Daniel 7 as one of the greatest prophecies in the entire Bible. And I would say that the message of Daniel 7 is very important for us today because when you read headlines, you sometimes ask yourself, where is God in all of this? You know, I'm serving the Lord somehow, but Lord, are we making headway at all? Uh, this afternoon, I uh, browsed some headlines all over the world using the Internet. 
I'd like to read you a sample of those headlines. Here's one. Two years after Boko Haram kidnapping, the search goes on for, Nigerian, for the Nigerian girl. Do you remember that? The 250 abducted by Boko Haram? Here's another headline from another part of the world. Is there really a mega earthquake on the way this week? You remember this? We had one in Ecuador. We had one in Japan. Everybody's asking now, is my country next? Another headline, Kurdish official says ISIS executed 250 women in Mosul. This was only yesterday. Here's another headline, why we should be really worried about the Panama Papers. Have you heard of that, the Panama Papers? So these are not very good news. And I remember a song that says, God is watching us, God is watching us, God is watching us. It's good, no? Then it says, from a distance. It was almost good. Of course not. God is not watching us from a distance. He's here and He cares. Peter says in 2 Peter 1.19, We have the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. My dear friends, knowing how it all ends compels us to realize that everything we do for God your work as a missionary, as a mobilizer, as a missiologist, as a seminary professor, as a writer, as a pastor, and all other kinds of work you do for the Lord, it's never in vain. Because if God ultimately wins, then God's mission will always succeed. And I hope you will always remember that if you forget everything I'm saying tonight. Because when you go back to whatever it is you're doing after this, I hope you'll never forget that. Everything we do is meaning because God ultimately wins. Could you please join me as I pause for prayer? Father, I just submit myself to you tonight. A servant just like the rest of the people have come here tonight. I praise and thank you for such a distinguished group of men and women that you brought to this place. They have blessed this church beyond measure just by showing up here. Lord, my heart has been moved and touched by especially the nation reports we've heard throughout this week. And Lord, I pray that in case there is a brother or sister tonight who just needs to, re to be reminded of what is here tonight, Daniel 7, I pray, Lord, they will come home set on fire afresh because, Father, you will win. Your mission will succeed. And those who have declared their allegiance to you, no matter how things look for them right now where they are, it will be used of you for your glory and for the good of your child. Be honored tonight, Father. The highest desire of our hearts tonight is you be honored because we want people to see you again sitting on the throne, sovereign over all things, your mission overseeing our missions here, your mission, the mission of God succeeding, even though our efforts are deemed feeble and sometimes we are very frail. But Lord, your mission will always succeed. Remind us of that, Lord, through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. May I be very transparent to you tonight. I'll be coming from an, an apologetic futurist sense here. So no apologies for that. Uh, if you have another persuasion, I, uh, I hope you will just listen. And you might be convinced to repent and be baptized after this. I'm just kidding. But this is a futurist perspective. And you normally know this. Uh, very basic thing. It will be most likely premillennial. So no apologies for that. I just hope you'll be open, even though that's the viewpoint we're taking. I just have two very simple points tonight. Uh, in verses 1 to 14, I'd like to talk about the outline of our world's future. You will see here how a dream used to humble a pagan king, returns in chapter 7 to uh, really remind us all who really rule. So let me read for you. If you have your Bibles, could you please open them to Daniel 7, 1 to 14. I'd like to read those uh, first 14 uh, verses for you. I, uh, uh, I will read them quite quickly. The, the dream of Daniel. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream. And visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, 
In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me were the four winds of heaven, churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground till it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. A second beast looked like a bear. It was raised on one of its sides. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, another beast. It looked like a leopard, and on its back it had four wings like a bird. This beast had four heads, and it was given authority to rule. After that, there was a fourth beast, terrifying, frightening, very powerful, with large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth spoke boastfully. Daniel was allowed, dear friend, to see the beast from the Gentile sea. So he saw in his dream four beasts. The first beast, uh, we, we uh, put some slides here. Now these are artists' representation. They may not be accurate. Some were paintings, some were digital creations. I just took snapshots of them, but they at least give us a picture of what he saw. He saw a lion coming from the sea. It had wings. And it was, of course, the king of the beast. This is a representation of the ruling power at that time, which was Babylon. And it said that the wings were stripped. And uh, eventually, he was uh, this wings, this, this lion, I mean, was able to stand his own two feet, and it was given a human heart. So we believe this could refer to the humbling of its king, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, when he was humbled by God with seven years of insanity until he was restored when he humbled himself before the Lord. But this lion represent the empire and later its uh, emperor. Even today, if you go into the British Museum, you will see excavations from Babylon's ruins, and you could see that the lion was indeed, the winged lion was the national symbol of Babylon. Then it said that Daniel next saw a bear. And the bear, it said, had three ribs in its teeth. It was raised on its one side. And from history, we know that what took over from Babylon was the Medo-Persian Empire. This empire was characterized by extremely large armies that overwhelmed not by superiority in skill, but simply by numbers. So the Persian army was known for simply overwhelming a slow, lumbering pace through its numbers and here, uh, the raised side might represent the Persian dominance from the Medo-Persian alliance, and the three ribs represent its victories over Egypt, uh, what was Turkey then called Lydia, and Babylon. And then the third animal was a leopard with the wings of a bird, and it had four heads. And today we know from uh, ancient history that the Grecian Empire took over Medo-Persia, and it conquered the Medo-Persia and other countries, especially through the leadership of Alexander the Great, simply by overwhelming speed. In fact, until today, in military academies all over the world, the strategies of Alexander the Great are being studied for how he relied on superior strategy, especially speed, to win. And the four heads, four heads here are probably representing the four divisions of his empire when he died, led by four different generals. But it's the fourth beast that really uh, struck the attention of Daniel, and this is one artist's digital uh, creation uh, of it, uh, made by one of our people here. Uh, he said this, this beast could not be described in any way. Well, it did have large iron teeth, uh, but, but it crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot the same. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. We now know from history that Greece was uh, eventually conquered by the Roman uh, Empire, or taken over, and that even until today, since the time that the Roman Empire gradually declined, there has been no major empire that took over from it. It was 40, 476 A.D. When uh, it gradually started declining. So, in one sense, we are in the time of the fourth beast. 
But Daniel saw in his vision something that wasn't revealed to Nebuchadnezzar before. The revived Roman Empire, which also represents the fourth beast, is actually under Satan's direct control. It's the kingdom of Satan, which is the kingdom of the Antichrist in the future, described in Revelation 13 to 19. That's why it's terrifying. It resembles no earthly beast because it might be a picture of Satan himself. Now, could you scroll back one, one slide? So many Bible scholars believe that the horns correspond to ten kings who will reign before Jesus sets up his millennial kingdom. Now, I'm always asked this when we, because we're right now in the middle of Revelation in our church. I'm always asked, Pastor, is it the European Union? I said, well, uh, there are more than 24 countries in the European Union. It's hard to say that. But if 10 doesn't represent a literal number, only a symbolic number, they may not yet be off the hook. And yet, an increasing number of Bible scholars will, uh, are now mentioning two other suspects as to the revived Roman Empire. One I'm hearing recently is the G8. The G8 are actually nine countries, and they need one more country, there'll be 10. And everybody expects China to complete the 10 countries. That'll be the most powerful group of nations on earth. Ten in number. Uh, I've read books recently uh, written by other scholars who say the Sunni Arab nations are forming a 20-nation confederacy. Uh, three, a month ago, they staged a very large war exercise in the Middle East, maybe just to show Russia uh, we're not something to be trifled with. And again, some are saying they could be a viable suspect in that revived Roman Empire, and each of the proponents of these three say any of them could trace some roots back to the Roman Empire somehow. And if you ask me who of those I believe, I have no idea who. Just telling you the three candidates for the revived Roman Empire. And they make for interesting speculation, but that's where all, that's the only place we could go, speculation. I believe God wants us to focus more on the risen Christ because we shouldn't be here anymore if you believe in the rapture. Now, it says there, ne next slide please, as Daniel was looking, he saw from the fourth beast that had ten horns, one of the horns becoming prominent. He said there was a little horn which came up, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. And we believe this represents a king who will arise to power by gradually taking over, not in a violent way perhaps, but by political measures, the uh, authority of three other kings. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth that spoke uh, boastfully or spoke great things. This is in the King James Version. And we know from a most uh, accepted Bible interpreter that this represents the future Antichrist. Now, it says here, as we continue with the story, that Daniel in verses 9 to 11 will see the king of heaven conquering the beast. And I will now read for you the rest of the passage of Daniel 7. He said, As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool, his throne was flaming with fire, and his wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. Now he, he saw the effect of the court sitting. He said, I continued to watch because of the boastful word the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision, there was one like a son of man coming from with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And I could just stop here. The sermon is over, just reading this. I mean, beloved, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, coming 
to God the Father and claiming his rightful place as the one who rule over the world. And these are such beautiful words. He has given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations of every language worshipped him. This is why we cannot be discouraged in our service. This is why we must always look at missions as the mission of God. That will never be derailed. And I know support for missions is declining worldwide. And I know that there are discouraging things happening worldwide. I know the discouragement could be within your very own church. It could be within your very own seminary that you teach in. It could be within your peers. But beloved, if you ever forget why we're doing this, if you ever get tempted to be discouraged, read Daniel 7 again. And you will remember that one like a son of man came with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days. And all peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. This is the one you serve. He gives it all meaning. He gives it all purpose. So the Son of Man receives his kingdom as we read. And you probably know the title Son of Man was a favorite self-designation of Jesus. He, it was used to describe him 80 times in the four Gospels. And the one whom God appointed to receive authority, glory, and sovereign power now takes what's rightfully his. The one who was despised and rejected the man. The man of sorrows shows himself now, here in our text, as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And beloved, it showed that the fourth beast was destroyed. When Jesus sets up his kingdom, the empire of the Antichrist will be completely crushed. And that's what we see in Revelation 19, 11 to 16. You know, this picture of Jesus here reminds me of the contrast we see in most common pictures of Christ. Do you, do you remember that? Uh, whenever there's a painting of Jesus Christ, what do you see? There's a good-looking, brown-eyed man with a very tall nose and long hair. You know, he looks so good, he, he looks so good-looking he couldn't hurt a fly. But that's not the picture that we see here. This is the Lord Jesus Christ taking his rightful throne and the wimpy, effeminate man created by some artist to represent Jesus is an injustice to the true nature of our king. You and I were not saved by a weak God, but by one before whom kings and demons tremble. Make sure, beloved, that you re re remember this as we serve him, and this is the one that we speak about to other people. That's a brief outline of our world's future. Now let's look at the outcome of our world's failures in verses 15 to 20 of Daniel 7. Here we will see that the failure of our world system to recognize God leads to its collapse. Nowhere is the theme of reaping what you saw more clearly shown than here, beloved. Uh, the Most High God, it says here, is sovereign over the kingdoms of man. So let me now read for you the remaining portions of Daniel 7. It says there, I, Daniel, was troubled in spirit. So he had already seen the whole vision, including the final victory of God, but he was troubled. And the vision that passed in my mind disturbed me. It said, I approach one of those standing there, it implies an angel, and ask him the true meaning of all this. So he, the angel, told me and gave me the interpretation. The four great beasts, the angel said, are four kingdoms that will rise from the earth. But the saints of the Most High will, re will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Then it said, then I wanted to know the true meaning of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others. And most terrified, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. I also wanted to know about the ten horns and about the other horn that came up before which three of them fell. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. He, the angel, gave this explanation. 
The fourth beast is the fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High and oppress the saints and try to change the times and laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times and half a time. That's three and a half years. But the court in heaven will sit and his power will be taken away and destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints, the people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. This, beloved, is what he was given as an interpretation. And uh, could we see this, please? The next slide. The meaning of the beast is that these were great nations of history and today. You know, what struck me here is that when it comes to God's viewpoint, the best achievements of men, their empires and kingdoms, in the sight of God are just beasts. They're just beasts, that's all. And God is not impressed with what usually impresses us. And what, that's what you learn here when the angel explains to Daniel everything he saw. He said, the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and possess it forever. In other words, we see here how God sees nations and history then and today. You know, this is very interesting for me because right now in the Philippines, we are three weeks away from probably one of the most unusual elections in our history. If you're staying here until May 9th, uh, you're welcome. Uh, I don't recommend it, by the way. Uh, <laughs> You see, this is going to be perhaps the only election in our history where we are choosing a president not because he's the most desirable, but because we were choosing the lesser evil among the four candidates. Can you imagine that? Uh, we're not really choosing who's the best. We're choosing who's the least damaging to the country. And as I was thinking about uh, preparing and reflecting on this, this you know, strangely comforted me. So this is how God sees all the kingdoms of this earth. We tend to be either intimidated, afraid, discouraged, or worried by the things that happen on earth, but God sees them as beasts. And so, beloved, who loses the most when a nation worships anyone but God? Psalm 2, verses 1 to 3, illustrates the nations concerning God. It says, the kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers gather together against the Lord and against the anointed one. Let us break their chain, they say, and throw off their fetters. What is God's response? He laughs. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. And so this is perhaps a question to myself. What is the right attitude, the one we pray, we have, and our national leaders have? In uh, Psalm chapter 2, 10 to 12, Therefore you kings, be wise, be warned. You rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you be destroyed in your way. For His wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed are all those who take refuge in Him. Some of me are working. I've been listening to the nation reports. I, I have a confession to make. I love everything I've heard. You see, in my room upstairs, there's a TV where I listen. So forgive me for not showing up all the time. And it's not fair. I have a TV upstairs. Uh, I love everything, but you know, my favorite part is listening to the nation reports. You know, I grieve when the presenter says, this is the difficulty. I rejoice when the presenter says, you know, despite the opposition, despite the persecution, despite the government against Christianity, this is the progress we're making. And I rejoice. You know, that's one of the most unforgettable things I will take away from this conference. The nation reports showing because God always wins. God's mission ultimately succeeds. It doesn't matter if Buddhism is a national religion and the government pushes it. It doesn't matter if Islam is, the gov is what the government in your country pushes. It doesn't matter if you are in a pseudo-Christian nation like the Philippines, and I'm sad to say that, 
pseudo-Christian because they are really the evangelicals are minority. But you know what, beloved? When I read this, when it says here that God actually warns in Psalm chapter 2, verse 10, Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned. He's telling them, kiss the sun. I remove all my anxieties about the Philippines on May 9, when we have our voting. And if there are any Americans here, I hope you're not worried about Donald Trump anymore. <laughs> Just remember Psalm chapter 2, 10 to 12. <laughs> So let's look at the meaning of the little horn. I have to mention this because it's part of the passage and I'm personally interested in it. It's the Antichrist. The fourth beast interests Daniel because of its great destructive power, but he is told that the same horn making war against the saints will ultimately be destroyed. In other words, someone who personifies the worst in humanity comes across as his best representative and gets global prominence. Not only does he lead the world against God, this satanically empowered imitation of Christ leads the world against the remnant of God's people and seemingly succeeds until his power is taken away. Last September 2015, the United Nations launched the, the Global Goals for Sustainable Development. That means that the United Nations, getting all the major nations to agree, targeted that by 2030, the nations will work together to eliminate extreme poverty. Uh, I'm wondering why it has attracted very little debate or opposition. That's, and, and I'm wondering, especially because Pope Francis himself was the one who kicked off this conference. But you know what? The ultimate agenda of this is actually to unite the world by having 17 common goals that lead to one ultimate goal, the elimination of extreme poverty. And beloved, as we move towards a cashless society, it's beginning to happen here, even in our, our third world country called the Philippines. As we move towards unifying the world, the world, as we talk about globalization, you know, the world will ultimately see that the solution to many of its problems is uniting under a common government common economic system, and a common leadership. And one day, that will result in a representative of the evil one himself taking over the world's system. And this is what Daniel saw. In other words, as current as the headlines, you see we're being set up right now by our own global efforts to one day make it easy for one to take over the world. And this is uh, something I just saw in a book somewhere. I took a snapshot, so it's not very clear. But these are some of the characteristics of this little horn. He will arise from the fourth beast. One of the ten horns is a summary. He will, uh, he's different from all the rest. He's stronger than his fellows. He will uproot three kingdoms. The word there used does not mean violently, but more by political means. He will blaspheme the Most High. He will pursue, persecute, slaughter the saints of the Most High. He will change times and laws. And then ultimately, He will be destroyed. And you know what, what this reminds me of? is a theme of permitted suffering for God's people. You see, before this was the incident of God's people being thrown in the fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Before this was the theme of Daniel being thrown among the den of lions. And you know, when I was considering this, as I was reading from Daniel 1 to 6, it just reminds me that being righteous and godly in this age on earth right now is actually an invitation to a more difficult life. Jesus never said that the following him as a disciple would ever be easy. In fact, he said, you have to die to self in order to be his disciple. You have to deny yourself. But beloved, whether God puts you in the furnace or allows you to be thrown in the lion's den or he spares you like he spared Daniel or he spares you like he spared Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or you become martyred like the early Christians, like the Christians that we have 
hearing in the nas national reports people dying for the faith. Whether God allows you to be a martyr or He delivers you by a miracle, the main thing that we see here, beloved, is God is glorified. Either way, all things work out for our good and the glory of God. It's one thing I've learned in my short five decades as a, as a human being. When God says all things work together for good, it means His child will receive God's ultimate good, perhaps in heaven, if not here on earth. But it will always be to the glory of God. And these two are never separate for God's child. The theme of permitted suffering. So will you please remember this the next time you go through your own difficulties? Whether God delivers you from them or you keep going through them for the rest of your life, either way God is glorified. Either way all things work out for our good because God's people will never lose, not in this life or the next. So this is our world, beloved. God sees it. This is the world that God allowed us to see in Daniel 7. The best of men in their temporary kingdoms are simply beasts with short reigns and ignoble ends. But for the author of time and history, this is how it ends. Daniel 7, 13 to 14. There was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days, led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. And all people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is everlasting. It will not be taken away. His kingdom will never be destroyed. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. And all rulers will worship and obey Him. Why, why must you keep serving? Why must I keep serving? Why is it that no sacrifice you and I ever make for Christ will ever be enough, will never be too much? Beloved, because His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. All rulers will worship and obey Him because the one we are serving will one day show to us that He is worth serving and He will reign over all things. That's why I chose to speak about prophecy tonight, beloved, because it tells us how it all ends. And knowing how it all ends is life changing because God always wins. The Christian never loses. Because God always wins no effort for Him, whether by individuals, by churches, by missions agencies, by movement, by missiology, are ever in vain. God gave us His view of history so that, so that our perspective will always be eternal. Like I told you from the beginning, because God always wins. God's mission ultimately succeeds. And because God always wins, so will the believer. We will never lose, not in this life, not the life to come. Let me pray. Father, we thank you because your word is eternal. We thank you, Lord, that even though times are hard, serving you has not become easier but harder. And Lord, I just, just in case, there is a brother or sister here tonight who has been secretly struggling, been discouraged, been saying, why am I even doing this? Why am I still here? Lord, remind them, the one they're serving will one day rule over all things. And he will make it worth it. He will show why it is worth it. Remind us, Lord, when, the, when life and ministry become hard, that because you win, because you win, your mission ultimately succeeds. Father, I especially am burdened for my brothers and sisters from nations that are not open to the gospel, the ones we've heard reporting throughout this week. Will you be with them, Lord? I feel for them and their difficulties, but thank you for their steadfastness. I pray for my own country, Lord, the supposed Christian nation in Asia, where the very freedom of religion has been its biggest curse, perhaps, because we have so many nominal Christians 
And being a Christian here in the Philippines costs almost nothing. That's why we have so many uncommitted people. I thank you, Lord, for the countries where there is persecution. There you are cleaning out the false ones. And the true believers are advancing the gospel. Have mercy in my own country, Lord. Help us have that same rapid progress in the gospel where it will advance because true people stay in the church and make sharing the gospel a part of their life. It is everything to them. It is not just something to do in their spare time. Have mercy on the Philippines too, Lord. Even as I pray, you continue to bless the other countries who have been presenting this week. We pray this all, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.